Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 8th of March Planning Committee. Well done, everybody, for getting here. Easy for me. I only had to walk across town, but I know quite a few of you have come in from North East Somerset, so thanks for making the effort. Um, my name is Councillor Sue Craig. I'm chair of the committee. Can I just ask people if you've got anything that makes a noise, can you turn it off or on silent, please, so we don't get disturbed during the meeting? And can I also say the meeting is being filmed, so, uh, and the recording will be available on the council's website. If you do not wish to be filmed, you should make yourselves known to the camera operators who are here in the corner to my left. Um, and now I'll just turn to the Democratic Services Officer to read out the emergency evacuation procedure. Thank you, Chair. If the continuous alarm sounds, you must evacuate the building by one of the designated exits and proceed to the named assembly point, which is in the orange grove on the green outside Browns. The designated exits are signposted. From this room, you use the main door and then the main exit of the building. Thank you. Thanks very much. And uh, I don't believe we have any apologies for absence and substitutions. Karina could just confirm. No, we don't. Uh, item three, there are no declarations of interest from me. Anybody else want to give me anything? No, nothing from the committee members. Um, no urgent or business agreed by the chair. Um, moving to item five, and I'll just ask the Democratic Services Officer to inform you of the public speaking procedure. Thank you. Speakers will be called to speak immediately after the case officer has made their presentation about the application. The order of speakers and the time allowed for speaking will be as follows. The Parish and Town Council representatives will speak first and will be allowed three minutes in total. Objectors to an application will be allowed three minutes in total. Supporters of an application will be allowed three minutes in total. If there is more than one objector or supporter of an application, they must share the three minutes allowed to each side. Ward councillors not on the committee who have indicated that they wish to speak about an application may do so for a maximum of five minutes. Speeches will be timed by the traffic light system you can see on the table next to me. At the start, the light will be green and will turn to amber when there is one minute of speaking time remaining. When the light turns red, speakers should immediately conclude their remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. The minutes of the last meeting have been circulated. Do I have any comments or can I have someone to move and second approval? Councillor Davis to move, seconder. Councillor Bromley. Thank you, I'll sign those in a minute. So we'll turn to the um, items for the day. The first one is our site visit, which was carried over from last meeting, uh, Millbarn. Welton, and if I could ask the case officer, Danielle, to present your report, if you're ready, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so this application relates to Mill Barn, which is situated in Welton, Midsummer Norton. The application proposes the erection of a new external classroom, including a landscape wall, pizza oven, and valleyed roof. The site is set within the wider manor farm, which forms part of a historic farmstead, including a grade two listed building within the site curtilage, as well as a grade two star listed property to the west of the site. So site location plan on the left with the area of development outlined in red. And then on the right hand side, we've got the area of photography. The red arrow is pointing towards the development site. The Yellow star to the left is the grade two star property and the star to the right is Mill Barn, which is grade two. The yellow dashed line uh, is the route of the public right of way. So just some existing and proposed plans existing on the left and proposed on the right. You can see the development down in the right hand corner. And just a closer up view of the floor plan and of the roof plan. And then just some elevations. So top left, we've got the east elevation and then bottom, the west. And then we've got the south elevation at the top, shows the barn in the background and then the proposed compost toilets. And then just some site images. Uh, so this is looking from the west towards where the site will be. So the development will be to the, to the right-hand side of the large barn there. 
and just further into the site where the development is proposed. And then this is just looking from the opposite direction. And then the bottom right one is, um, I'm still on the public right of way and looking in towards the site. And then that is the public right of way. So officer recommendation is to put it for the reasons stated within the committee report. Thank you very much. We have one speaker on this one. If I could ask Charlotte Lucas to come to the front. Thank you, Charlotte. Start when you're ready. Um, morning, everyone. I've wanted to start by saying thank you to so many of you for coming out. I also wanted to take this three-minute opportunity to cover off some points that were raised in the last meeting. The first one was um, a comparison of the other existing local forest schools in the area. Um, and I just wanted, hopefully, for those of you that have come out, you realize the difference in our alternative provision being outside for at least eight hours per day throughout every term time, which is a, a massively different operating system to the existing local forest schools as well. Um, second point raised was <clears throat> the, safe, the safeguarding and the fencing. Um, and we clarified that we would obviously stay in line with agricultural fencing, but make it appropriately safeguarded for the children. Um, the curtilage of the listed building was another point, and when you're sat in the classroom, or where would the classroom would be, I think the eye line of the grade two listed buildings weren't particularly in sight as well. I think that was um, confirmed, so I just wanted to reiterate that for anyone that couldn't attend. Um, I know in the last meeting the need for an alternative provision was raised, and we sent all the details and the numbers that we have with regards to send provision and children that might need send an alternative provision in the area. And we pass those on to the planning officer, Danielle. So hopefully if there's any questions there, she can furnish you with those. And finally, I know um, transport was a, was a big issue for our, some of our local residents. And um, hopefully you all um, decided or, or, or sort of... <laughs> Um, came to a conclusion that although we do add to a three flow of traffic on a, on a tricky part of the road on, on Millard's Hill, we don't actually impact residential challenges with parking there because we have so much opportunity for parking on site. Um, and I've finished and I'm within my time. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, questions from... The committee, Councillor Jackson. One thing I, I haven't quite registered, we've got a parking plan and we've got now figures of entry and exit. Uh, whether parents are allowed to actually drive into the school to drop the children off or whether they have to drop them outside in the road and, and walk them into school. Because obviously that would make a difference to the congestion if, the, if there is a drive-in facility like there is at some of our pr other primary schools. So the parents can drive in to site and use the parking provision there to drop their children off. Councillor Hughes. Thank you. Um, so I think my questions really are, I think that they're all based around the transport plan rather than anything else on this application so it's just really looking at the, the concerns that have been raised locally particularly about vehicle movements and access so I just want to understand that a bit better so if I understand correctly from the transport plan currently the we're looking we're, we're currently have an attendance of around about 60 to 70 children but they have a registered um, capacity of 105 so there's a potential to grow from 60 or 70 up to 105. Um, and if I understand from the reports, the, um, the vehicle movements at the moment, we have a peak in the mornings at 8 a.m. of around 83 vehicle movements at 8 a.m. That's 50 vehicle movements into the sites and 33 
vehicle movements out, out of the sites. So assuming that then if, the, if this site reaches its registered capacity of 105, we're going to see a, a, a more than a 30% increase on that figure at ATM, is that correct? Or is that, the is that likely? Sorry, what was the percentage increase? You so, so at the moment, if we're working on a, on a basis that there are 60 to 70 children on site at the moment, and we're seeing 83 vehicle movements at 8 a.m., yeah. if the site reaches its registered number of 105 children, we're going to see a significant increase in, on the 83 vehicle movements at 8 a.m. Yeah, you'd expect a corresponding increase in the vehicle movements as the capacity. You'd expect a... Uh, corresponding increase in the vehicle movements as the capacity approaches 105. Okay. And I'm trying to understand more about how that's going to be managed. I know that there's, there's, there's mention of um, staggered pick-up and drop-offs. Um, how is that going to be... How, how is that going to cope with that? Because Millard's Hill is, is one of those strange little um, areas that has a number of transport issues you know from a rat run to um, narrow roads and congestion at certain points of the day. So I'm just wondering how, that, how we can mitigate those problems of those so many vehicles at 8 a.m. Yeah, so I would um, first just like to note that the current existing permissions would allow to up to 105 students. That already has consent. Um, yeah. This application allows for a further eight students, so that's the quantum of development that we have to assess today. Um, with the, the condition that is recommended, uh, that does include the staggered start times and part of the travel plan, um, and that would require different drop-off times for different classes so that not all, all the vehicles will be entering at once, um, just to ease that congestion slightly going in and out of the site. Okay, so can we actually specify the maximum num number of vehicle movements at each of those times within that staggered pick up and drop off i don't think you'd be able to specify the um, a maximum number of vehicle movements but all you could do was specify which age group start at which time so yeah you couldn't put a cap on vehicle movements as such okay thank you can i ask a... so another thing another another area i wanted to just understand from the transport plan so in i think it's 1.1.9 1 .1 it says that um the current application for an outdoor classroom for eight key stage one, five to seven years, pupils, is the first stage of the master plan for the sites, which proposes further outdoor community support, uh, which proposes further outdoor classroom bases to allow progression from key stage one to key stage five with community supported agricultural projects for young adults aged 16 to 25. So I'm assuming that's not covered in this current application. That's correct. So we can only consider the increase in this application. We can't really give any weight to potential future upcoming applications. Okay. So just to be clear, the, 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 um, the expansion of this site onto further community supported projects for young adults, would that require further planning applications or, or is any of that aspect covered within this current application? So none of the future proposals are covered within this application. This application only covers the external classroom and the increase of eight students and two staff. Um, if future applications come forward, with, which include operational development, that would require planning permission and will be assessed at that time. Okay, can I ask one final question? Sorry, I don't want to hog the whole meeting. Um, so there, is, there is also mention in the report about an a car park extension that was approved in 2017 that's yet to be implemented. Um, do you know what that exp expansion is and, and how much extra parking that provides? Um, I don't know the exact number of the difference with the current provision and the proposed provision, but um, it, it does increase the parking provision on site. Um, this application has been assessed in terms of the increase in eight students without that parking provision, and it is that is acceptable, but it also assesses if that parking was, was to be implemented and it is also acceptable in those terms as well. Okay, so I'm just trying to understand what it is that's actually determining the capacity of the site, both in number of vehicles and in the number of students. I'm trying to understand where that capacity is, what controls that capacity. 
I mean, we, this application can only assess the increase in H students and the associated vehicle movements. Um, that those vehicle movements can be accommodated within the existing provision on site. Um, it will be beneficial for the consented parking provision to be brought forward and implemented. Um, but if it doesn't, the site can accommodate the increase in traffic flow for this application specifically. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, do we have any more questions? Councillor Bromley. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, it's just uh, again about transport, really. And um, so I saw mention of the, um, I can't remember the bus the service number, but um, the bus service to Midsummer Norton, I just wondered if that route is secured. And, and I realise it, it, it may not be suitable for parents of SEN children to, to, to use the bus, but will, would this maybe alleviate some of the other traffic on, on that route? I mean, does it go through down Millard's uh, Road, Millard's Hill? Yeah, the um, original transport statement put very limited weight on the, the benefit of the bus service that is going to be lost from Midsummer Norton, but there's also going to be another bus service that's likely to replace it, although the routing of that hasn't yet been fully determined. So I think in terms of the overall assessment of the scheme, um, it was marginal whether it would make any impact whatsoever, and then that was assessed from the very beginning. So I don't, I don't think it would change our view. Um, but it's unlikely to be a key benefit. Okay, do we have any more questions? Councillor Jackson? Well, just to clarify on the question of the bus routes, because things have been very fluid, and I can think it's utterly reasonable what it says in the package, but the, there is a bus stop at Stones Crop, well, it's West Clues, really, uh, coming away from Midsummer Norton and another one at the crossing just by Stones Cross going into Midsummer Norton for the 414 bus, uh, which is a Somerset bus and is not under any threat. So there is actually a bus coming up from Radstock which would drop the children within quite easy walking distance of this site, just going down Station Road. The, it's quite walkable for a small child, I would have thought, or with a pushchair. Uh, and the 174, which is one of our regular mainline buses down the A367, that goes round this part of the... Um, no, wait a minute, it doesn't take it back. It only did that because there was a diversion. Um, but it's not too far from, uh, I would have said, from the uh, upper end of um, the high street where the 174 does park. But um, we had a briefing yesterday on this West Link um, system that's going to drop people. And I would have thought that this location would qualify for this. Uh, I won't call it dial a ride. I'm just trying to remember what, what it is. But it is possible and doable, I would have said, on public transport as the Wecker Mayor is now clarifying things. Thank you for that extra information. I think it's DRT direct request or something. Question in all that excitement. Could we just go back on the slides to the picture of the roof that's going over this new structure? Because I, I couldn't quite get in my mind that, that one. And then there was a picture, a photo that sort of looked a bit like uh, the Sydney Opera House. The sort of wings coming. In. Yes, that's, that's the one. I, what's the sort of proportions? Isn't that, is that really an appropriate design? Um, so I don't know the exact dimensions of, of the height of the roof, um, but these are you know, open sections, um, so you will be able to see through the, the, the roof form here, and then this is the wall which is um, made up of various materials. Um, so I think it, it, in plan form, it looks a bit more um, built form-like than it would be in real life because there are visual routes through given that the roof form is open, it's not fully enclosed. The question is, do you consider that that sort of structure uh, is appropriate within the curtilage of a listed building? So it has um, been assessed that there will be some harm to the curtilage of the listed building. That is mainly due to the spread of development. The development in and of itself um, is considered to be acceptable. Um, next to the barn is uh, subservient to the barn, which is directly adjacent. 
Um, but the lesser substantial harm, which is caused to both the setting of the litter building and the conservation area, is at the very lower end and it is considered to be outweighed by public benefit through the provision of the school places. Thank you. I mean, just to get some perspective on the size, Councillor Jackson, the, the line on the left of that lower picture is the side of the barn, presumably, so the barn's substantially larger than the shelter that's being built. Well, to be quite honest, Chair, I thought that barn that's there already looked so horrible that the more it got blocked out by a solid structure of the new classroom, the better. Good point. Right, do we have any more questions? If not, we can move to the debate. No? I'll, I'll ask Councillor Hughes to open the debate for us. Thank you. Sorry, I seem to be talking a lot this morning. It's um, okay. So, anyway, thank you. I mean, uh, firstly, I mean... I, I think we should thank Charlotte for the, the site visit. I think it was very interesting and certainly one of the more entertaining site visits, particularly on World Book Day. Oh, um, it was, um, and I think we should acknowledge that, um, that we are fortunate to have this facility and this type of facility in our ward, so we're, we're very grateful for that. I think certainly as far as the, the building, the structure itself is concerned, I don't think there's been really any real concern. I think with the residents, I don't think there's a, an issue there. Um, I think most of the issues have really arisen around the access and the problems that Millard's Hill has with its transport issues, with it being a bit of a rat run and lots of, lots of issues that, I, I mean, it's, it's one of those, Millard's Hill is one of those small communities that's, that's never designed to cope with what it's trying to cope with now in terms of traffic and there's no scope to, to change that. So we've got to try and work within the confines that we've got and manage the transport in a way that there's a balance between the needs of the businesses like the nursery and also the residents that live there. So I think, I think having within the transport plan the option to have um, staggered drop-offs and pick-ups I think is, is good. I think that will help. I would hope that we can perhaps, perhaps we can explore looking at that in a little bit more depth to tr maybe increase the amount of staggering that's going on to re reduce the, the impact on the area. Um, I don't know if that's possible. It may be with a, a delegate to permit. I mean, the other area that we like to explore more would be the, I mean, it runs, the cycle track runs alongside the sites. So there's a lot of potential there to try and encourage more use of the cycle track and access uh, pedestrians or by cycling to the site and sort of try and take away this vehicle usage level. Um, I would certainly say, uh, I would encourage Charlotte to, to look, at, and I'm willing to help with this, to, to encourage more dialogue between the business and the residents, particularly when it comes to thing, controversial issues like the access and the vehicle movements. That it's, it's always going to be a difficult discussion, but I think we, we need to encourage that conversation because say it is a small community down there and we should all try and work on it together um, but I think on balance I think probably the benefits of this development um, outweigh the harm um, I think we need to look carefully at any future any any future expansion plans very carefully but uh, that's my comments for now thank you Thank you, Councillor Hughes. Any more contributions to the debate? Councillor Bromley? Yes, I mean, I, I, I would agree with Councillor Hughes that the, um, the benefits of, of serving the needs of, of SEND children with protective characteristics, um, their needs are maybe not met in, in mainstream education, and um, obviously there's a, a, huge need, a, a huge demand for, for this um, facility. So I, I would... I would definitely su su support the application. Thank you. Councillor McPhee. <clears throat> I just wanted to um, support the uh, DRT option because I understand that what happens with this demand response is that if they identify very regular uh, journeys, they can end up sometimes introducing... Uh, a new vehicle, etc., and it would be very suitable, I think, uh, for public transport to access the uh, the barn using DRT. And we certainly hope that it works out. Thank you, Councillor McPhee. Any more contributions? 
to the debate, Councillor Hansel. Actually, I'll, um, I'll let Councillor uh, Hodge go first. Okay, Councillor Hodge. Yes, this is just a minor contribution, just picking up on one of the points Councillor Hughes made. I mean, I, I, I appreciate his concern about the, and the residents' concern about the transport and drop-off times and the, the number of vehicles coming and going. And I just wondered that the detail I can see on the transport plan about staggered times, whether, whether there is any scope for um, en enhancing that through a delegate to permit. Um, I don't know whether Councillor Hughes would like to say a bit more about what he thought might be added. I, I can see that there is one change in time so that the nursery will arrive at a different time from the main school, but I can't see any detail of anything else, but I might have missed that. But I'd be interested to know what more we could do to kind of um, build on that point, if possible, with a delegate to permit. Okay. Um, I don't know whether the officer can add anything else that, about the condition and how it will read. Um, so the condition re requires a travel plan pre-occupation um, and that will detail the staggered start times. Um, so the assessment can be made as part of that discharge condition application. Um, and if it is felt at that time that there needs to be more staggering, then that's the thing that we can look at at that time. Can I just ask, so the document we've got in front of us, a, a travel plan that was on the documents, that does have details in it. So does that come into effect or are you saying there'll be a condition for a, a, a new worked up version of that? Or? So the condition would require a new version, um, which may be more detailed. And presumably the ward councillor could take some part in, in that. Councillor Hughes? Sorry, yes, I think, I think it's important that we, we explore that because it's one thing to say we have these staggered drop-off options, but if every, every parent chooses only to use one of those times, then it doesn't work. So we need to understand how we're going to encourage the use of the staggered mm -hmm. system, um, whether, that can be, whether there can be some condition that spreads the use of the, the, the access to the vehicles. Um, at the moment, I can't see how... We can, we can avoid all the parents turning up at 8 o'clock, even if we offer them staggered options. So, so I think what the officer is saying is that that all, will all be determined. There's, there's no need for a delegate to permit because it's already a condition that's going to be against the application if it is permitted. And you will certainly be able to get involved in the shape of that. If, if that's our understanding of it, then that's fine. It's just that so we just need to ensure that, that that staggered system is effective. It's not just uh, numbers on paper, that, they, that there is a system to make sure that the vehicles do arrive in a staggered process. Uh, that system will be uh, assessed and determined at the discharge condition stage. Um, it, may, it may be the case that um, part of that plan allocates classes to the staggered times rather than it being parent choice. That's something that can be reviewed in the application for the discharge. Thank you. So, so I'm just trying to understand, do we need to delegate to permit or not on that point? Um, I would say no, because we can assess that when the application comes in to discharge those details. All right. Um, can I just go back to Councillor Howe? Uh, thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, firstly, can I uh, thank the officer for a very clear report uh, this time and at the last meeting? Uh, and can I thank the applicant for a very clear uh, application and exposition of, uh, of her case this morning? Um, I'm, uh, having read the documents, having listened to all the arguments, uh, I would like to propose a motion that uh, we support the officer recommendation to permit. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hansel. Uh, do I have a seconder for that? Are you offering to second, Councillor Bromley? Bromley? Okay. So we will continue with the debate. I think Councillor Jackson wanted to speak. Well, I, I just wanted to make a suggestion, and I have to say I would be more comfortable with delegate to permit in order to get this um, transport plan nailed a bit more clearly but uh, we've, we've discussed the drop-off in the morning time 
but it seems that the pickup time is in a very narrow time band, uh, which surprised me a bit, and I'm, I'm wondering what the effect is of having all the children picked up within 30 minutes. I'm not sure anyone can answer that, the officer. I mean, that'll be part of the discussions that you have for the discharge of the condition, presumably. Yeah, that's correct. We can explore that further when they apply to discharge that condition and that travel plan. So just on the whether it needs to be delegated to permit, I don't know if our senior planning officer has a view on that. I, I don't feel that it is necessary, but... Thank you, Chair. Um, well, in my view, it's not necessary for it to be delegated to permit. Um, we, we have a condition suggested, condition number two, which requires the submission of a travel plan uh, prior to occupation. Um, the effect of dealing with this matter as delegate to permit, would the, the only real effect of that would be to bring forward um, the assessment of those details. The, the condition requires those details to be submitted and, submitted and approved prior to occupation. Um, if it was delegate to permit, those details would need to be submitted and approved immediately before we could issue the permission. So it, it's really just a timing thing, Chair. But I mean, as officers, we're, we're happy with it to be left to condition and, and to be resolved prior to occupation. Okay, well, we have, we have a motion on the table to uh, support the officer's recommendation to permit, so we can go, go with that. Go with, go with that now. If that falls, then obviously we can do a delegate to permit Yes, Councillor Hughes. So, just to be clear, I think the concern here, certainly for me, is the, the transport plan details um, a staggered system, but it doesn't actually give you the mechanism for how it's going to be implemented and managed. So I think that's why we need delegate to permit so that the applicant can provide a mechanism for how, they, how it's actually going to be implemented. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, it does, and I don't think anybody's saying that that shouldn't happen. Okay. What the officer is saying is that will happen, that what is there at the moment isn't the final thing, okay. and that discussion will happen when the condition is discharged. Um, if it's made delegate to permit, then that would mean it would ha have to happen before then, but it will happen either way. So, But as I say, if people feel really uncomfortable about that, then they can not go with council and councils motion and um, we can return then to a, a different one. Councillor Bromley? Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask something about the, um, from my understanding of the site visit, of the um, um, sort of try to push people into a sort of a definite time for drop-offs and pickups. is that um, due to the nature of some of the children there, the SEN children, it's actually often difficult to establish a fixed time when the carer can get them out of the house and to school. So it may, may be quite hard with some of the children there with special needs to have this very fixed time. So it may be that for some of these children, the times have to be more flexible any, anyway. It's just what I remember from the site visit. Thank you. And that can all be discussed. And I'm sure Councillor Hughes will be involved in that discussion. So, so do we have any more contribution to the debate before we go to the vote? No? So um, the motion we have on the table before us is to support the officer's recommendation proposed by Councillor Hounsell and seconded by Councillor Bromley. All those in favour, please. And that is unanimous. Thank you very much. So now if we could go on to our next one, just give the officers a moment to switch over. Thank you. Okay, if you'd like to go ahead when you're ready. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is um, agenda item two, and it's for St. Julian's Church High Street in Wellow, which is in Bath Avon South Ward, and it's for the erection of a single-storey extension to the church to provide WC and kitchen facilities. 
Um, you'll be aware that there's um, a, an update report that's circulated, but I just wanted to, um, uh, for those that aren't aware of that, um, just point out the salient features of those uh, last minute uh, consulty um, have come in from Historic England, um, who provided a sort of um, initial response, but they have now provided a final response following their site visit, where they continue to um, raise the issue of harm from uh, both the visual harmony of the um, exterior of the church being interrupted by the um, proposed extension and also by the um, proposed new door opening um, and potential loss of um, quite a significant historic fabric. And they've also, in their latest letter, um, suggested that there's still options available for alternative facilities. Um, going on to ecology, um, the applicants have um, also come back now with a high-resolution photographic survey of the North Tower and uh, North Isle West Walls to show that the um, stonework in that, in that area is in good condition, and that has been seen by our, our ecologist, um, and uh, they have come back. Oh, sorry, I should also add that the um, uh, applicants have also said that the roof light can now be uh, fitted with a blackout blind that will be light sensitive, so it won't be managed by human touch, if you like. It will be um, blackout, the blackout blind will automatically come into force when the daylight starts to fade. Um, and they've also offered some biodiversity net gain with the um, sparrow roost um, terrace, as they call it, um, to be fitted into the extension. As a result of that, our ecologist has come back saying that they're still concerned about the overall impact that the roof light, light spillage could um, cause even with this blind amendment that is proposed and they're still requiring um, either a, a light spillage engineer, a light lightning engineer to look at the light spillage issue from the um, roof light or alternatively to have a bat survey carried out by the um, church. So that is still an issue, although it has meant that we can now remove from the proposed uh, reason for refusal um, for the ecology side um, the issue about biodiversity because that is now being um, clearly um, mitigated by the proposed roost that is um, uh, the applicants have said they can do. So moving on. This is the location plan of the church. It's on the north side of the high street towards the eastern end of the village. This is um, just a brief uh, street scene for those that don't know Wello, um, showing the church, which is raised up above the main high street there. And for context, just to show you what uh, listed buildings there are, I, within the site, there are a number of chest tombs that are listed. And also outside the site, there's a number of houses in the area that are grade two listed. St. Julian's is obviously grade one listed building, so it has even more significance than normal grade two listed buildings or two star even. <clears throat> and this is a, a, a section from the conservation area appraisal showing where St. Uh, Julian's Church is in the context of the conservation area, which is the red boundary you see around this um, map. I've only put in one half, half of the village. The other half is it's too long a village to put on the whole screen. But you can see that the, that the um, church has been um, identified as a landmark building, um, significant views from it and into it from around the site including from the spring called St. Julian's Well, which is to the north of the church. And it's just within the conservation area there. And there are several um, public 
rights of way that um, go around the back of St. Julian's Church to the north of the site and up one side of it. So this is a view again of the south elevation of St. Julian's Church showing the main entrance to the site and also a picture of the current WC arrangement. From the rear, this is the north elevation and these photos have been taken from the public footpaths that go at the back of the site, um, uphill generally. So obviously you can see into the site from various points. So both these photos are taken from different footpaths in the vicinity of the church. And the arrow shows where the um, proposed extension will go on the back of the uh, north, north tower, the west tower, the north side of it. Um, these are photographs taken again in more detail from the back of the site showing an existing vestry on the eastern end of the church, which was added in the Victorian period. And to the west is the um, tower itself and the site of the extension and more detailed shots of that area showing the end of the North Isles west, western uh, stained glass window and the buttresses on both that um, aisle and also on the back of the north of the tower. Um, this is a shot of the nearest property, which is called Church House, um, and has a, quite a large extension at its rear, two-story extension at its rear, and you can see the windows that would be facing the extension. Um, but I'm also aware that they have recently put in some planting along their boundary. Um, you can see the <laughs> latest tree coming in there. This is a plan of the whole of the church, um, which is not to scale, but shows a number of accesses into the church or out, as the case may be. Um, so we've got the main porch I don't know whether you can see that arrow there. This is the main entrance in here from the south. And then there's also a west door here in the tower, which is used, I believe, for such things as weddings, more ceremonial events, um, funerals, possibly, coming in this door here and down straight down the nave in the aisle. Um, there's also a door on the north side, and there are doors within the chancel. This one is to the vestry here, which is the Victorian edition. Um, just to note also that the chancel was um, rebuilt in the um, latter part of the 19th century, whereas the rest of the church is thought to be pretty much 1372 in date and very little altered from that time. This is an interior shots of the church um, showing it's, it's got a magnificent interior. Nobody can doubt the quality of that space. It is um, pretty unique um, with the original Jacobean pews still in place. Um, so this is the um, view from the tower looking down the main aisle towards the altar and the screen here. Um, and then turning round, looking the other way towards the tower here and the west door. And that's just here is a picture of the picking up on the main entrance into the church. This is the actual site where the proposed new doorway will be. And you can see there are different forms of um, construction in this location not fully understood. Um, we know we're dealing with at least uh, 14th century fabric, but it could be some of this maybe earlier fabric because it is known or thought to be the case that there was an earlier um, church on this site at one time. So the proposal is um, just showing you again the location which is in this 
area here, so on the north side of the tower and on the western side of the north aisle in this location. And this is the roof proposal, and you can see the roof light in this location. That's um, an elevation showing as it is now and the proposal and within the context of the church as a whole. More detailed um, drawing showing the elevations. So this elevation is the elevation that will have windows on it, and that will be facing north out into the churchyard. And the materials are generally um, going to be stone, some of which will be um, reusing stone from the opening that, will, that is proposed to be formed in the tower. Um, and then, obviously, ashlar will be brought in as well. Um, the roof itself is a turn-coated stainless steel um, and aluminium uh, framed window, double-glazed windows are also proposed. Ground floor um, plan in more detail for you, showing the opening that's proposed in the tower going into a kitchenette and two separate toilets, one of which is disabled and there will also be baby changing facilities available. Um, and this drawing just shows the extent of the drainage that's proposed. The sections I think are really helpful to understand how the building is proposed to be um, effectively dug into the ground. So the, the levels of the ground outside the church are quite high on, this, on the north side of the church. So there will be a need to dig down into the ground, which obviously has potential archaeological issues um, which have been addressed by the applicants. So there'll be a need for some quite considerable amount of archaeological um, investigation into potential deposits in this area. Um, you can also see that the height of the roof is taken into account the sill of that window on the end of the north aisle. So it comes below this area here. And another section through the extension showing the roof light in this location and the actual opening in the tower and the formation of this doorway. Just to remind you that that's where the doorway will be, roughly, in that location. And this is a drawing showing the extent of works that will be needed to be done in order to make it structurally stable within that tower. Um, this is a structural engineer's report, or, sorry, um, engineering drawing showing the extent of uh, grouting and other strengthening works that are needed, like a lintel here, to actually for allow that opening to um, work structurally. Um, as I said, Historic England have suggested alternatives, and this is just an example of an outside toilet in a, in a churchyard. And um, kitchen facilities that can be disguised to look like pieces of furniture that are known to be used elsewhere quite successfully in churches. And this is just uh, to remind you of the report's um, recommendation for refusal on the basis of those reasons um, as set out in my report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, so we have a few speakers on this one. If I could ask Councillor Pat Cordell to come up first of all from Wellow Power Parish Council. Thank you. Start when you're ready. Thank you. Good morning, Chair and Councillors. Um, Wellow Parish Council have concerns that St Julian's Church runs the risk of becoming redundant unless... Um, the toilet and the Mosley's kitchen are installed to attract greater use of the building, both for religious and secular events. As you can see, the church is a magnificent building, mentioned by Pevsner, 
and deserves to be cherished, and this can only be achieved by increasing the income necessary to maintain the fabric of the building. It's very popular for weddings, attracting couples from outside the parish. The availability of a toilet and kitchenette will encourage users to stay on at the church for a gathering, particularly after a funeral or christening, without the need to trek off somewhere else. I understand that recently the church was approached by an operatic society to perform, their only stipulation being that toilets were available. Sadly, they aren't, and this potential income was lost. We have on-street parking and the use of a large adjacent field for parking, but only, as you saw, a port which is fairly unpleasant. St. Julian's School, opposite the church, go there each week and their regular Sunday worship. Christmas services see the church full and other festivals attract large numbers. We have walkers, cyclists and visitors to the village. Uh, they frequent the church, which is opened each day all year round by a group of volunteers. The PCC has spent many hours, even years, working on a scheme which will be acceptable in planning and practical terms and most importantly, in aesthetic terms. Throughout time, alterations to the church have taken place, and now this proposal will bring it to the 21st century, which should be encouraged and supported to ensure its continuation as the most important building in the parish. With the greatest respect to the conservation bodies, if their guidelines had been followed hundreds of years ago, none of our churches would be as they are now. They have evolved over the centuries, and their very fabric shows these changes. We believe the modest addition to the building will not impact upon the amenity of the neighbours and will sit unobtrusively within its setting in the green belt, being slightly down and because of the hills. And well, OPC, please ask that you support this application. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> now, if I could have uh, Jane Rees, who's St. Julian's PCC rep, and Jonathan Hetreed, if I've said that correctly, who's the architect. You're, you're splitting your three minutes between you, are you? You're going to go first, and you're going to split the time between you. Okay, start when you're ready. Uh, good morning to you all. Uh, as you are aware from your visit... We are incredibly lucky in Wellow to have a magnificent church, which, with the exception of the chancel and vestry, is almost unchanged from 1430, when Sir Thomas Hungerford, the owner of Wellow and Farley Hungerford, undertook a major renovation. It is very much at the heart of the village and is greatly loved by the villagers, many of whom, although they are not regular churchgoers, come into the church for the peace and beauty. But without the facilities that are considered essential in today's world, we are greatly concerned that we will not be able to maintain and grow the church to serve the next generation and generations to come. Although the regular congregation is quite small, at the major festivals, such as Christmas and Easter, the church is often filled to overflowing. It has excellent acoustics and makes a wonderful venue for concerts and is used for other community activities, such as uh, the Christmas Bazaar. It is also very popular for weddings. It is a wonderful building, but the church is more than just the building. It is a community, and we want to provide for the needs of that community. We considered a number of options, as you will have seen, but feel that this is by far the best. It does not interfere with the magnificent interior. It does not compete with the beautiful exterior and will provide easy and safe access at the cost of a minimal amount of fabric. Last year, we celebrated the 650th anniversary of the consecration of the church and feel that by providing these facilities, we are helping to ensure that it will be in use for another 650 years. This location is so much the best fit, nestling between the tower and the north aisle, insignificant in comparison to both, low in the rising ground of the north field and only one and a half percent of the volume of the church as discreet as it should be <clears throat> of course any location around a church may have graves and despite having had a ground penetrating radar check show no voids it's fully accepted that an archaeological dig needs to be done before any other work on site this is understandably costly and the parish are committed to do it once they have consent hence the condition requested 
just as it's right outside, so it's even more appropriate inside, with the least impact on worship and the other special events that belong in this church, tucked away at the west end with a tower forming a natural lobby. The new doorway in the tower wall has been described as harm to the historic building, but we firmly disagree. The practical process of forming this doorway in the 1.2 metre thick rubble stone wall has been checked by the diocesan engineer. The wall is remarkably stable and well consolidated. Our new doorway, echoing that in the south wall to the tower stair, will be formed and vaulted in the wall's own stone, grouted in lime mortar, and will be a truly special experience for all who use it and appreciate the massive thickness of this medieval wall for the first time. This is the best solution in the best location for this wonderful church, and we commend it to you. Thank you very much, both of you. If you could turn your mic off, please. Thank you. And finally, we have uh, Councillor Matt McKay, the wall member. Morning, everybody. Um, uh, this is obviously a, a, a difficult application, and obviously the decision will weigh heavily on your minds. But in the 1400s, the average age that people died at was 30. Uh, although there were a lot of child deaths, the, the, if you made it to your 60s, uh, you, you, your peers would all be dead. Uh, you would be unique in that community. So that community that the church was built for, the elders in that community were in their 40s, uh, 30s and 40s. Uh, and that's why having no facilities didn't really matter uh, because those of us of a certain age with enlarged prostates don't have to worry about being away from a toilet for two hours. Um, you know, and, uh, and then as our population has got older uh, and become more infirm and with more medical conditions then it is a challenge uh, putting yourself out for a couple of hours every morning to be able to worship. And people want to be able to worship with some dignity. Uh, and this is what this application hopes to achieve. The trouble is that this is a secular system that we are judging this by. Uh, and the secular system is only concerned with the fabric of the historic building. Uh, and there is no right to uh, practice your worship with, with dignity. Um, you will see that uh, there was a Victorian vestry, uh, there was restoration in the 1950s and other planning applications around having the lead removed, uh, buttresses, buttresses reduced, installation of antennas and dishes and uh, equipment cabinets behind uh, glass plastic louvres. So there, there is change. The building has sought to modernise, um, but as you know, any change, anything screwed to uh, a listed wall causes harm, and, uh, and we can't get away from that. And any application that particularly seeks to put a doorway into a wall is going to cause harm and will undoubtedly fail CP6. And the officer has very little option uh, but to refuse in that case. But I'm, a, I'm convinced that the options put forward by the applicant is the one that causes the least harm. Uh, of all the options concerned. You saw how beautiful the interior was. Putting something in that interior uh, is going to cause harm both to the walls and the interior. Uh, this little outside space nestled there between the tower and the, and the north, uh, that window in the north side, is a, is a space that lends itself. And I think the, uh, the uh, precedent for putting it there is in the positioning of the vestry which is in exactly the same place but on the east side. So again, the vestry cut a hole in the wall to create the doorway. This application wants to do the same thing but on the west side. And, you'll, and you saw on the plans how it nestled in there. Um, uh, the design has been questioned as being a bit too modern and it failed, a number of design, or it failed on a number of design uh, points. But I think... Uh, the use of the uh, stone that will be removed is, is good. And I think, obviously, the fact that it's a steel roof reflects the fact that the original structure has had its lead removed and is a steel roof. So there are reasons uh, for, for thinking this is not a bad design. And the low nature of it and the small impact is to be commended. Um, it remains, uh, it remains uh, subservient and deferential 
to the original structure. Um, the landscape, you see it's a, a landmark church in a rural setting. It's beautiful and it's evocative. But again, in a secular system, it is the fabric of the structure that must be preserved at all costs. For the residents of the community, it is also a source of pride, a place of worship, a place of gathering. And they, have, they live with this building uh, as their ancestors did in many cases. So is it right that we conserve exactly what was built, even though its uses has changed because of the demographic of the people using it have changed? Well, this application seeks to bring the church fully into uh, the center of its community once again so that it can remain in use for generations to come. And it can be done. You've seen the engineers' uh, reports there. Uh, the final decision maker, it's worth noting in this instance, is the church's own uh, faculty system. But we will listen to your comments. Uh, if you're minded to refuse, we will listen to your comments to see if we can come back with a better suggestion. But uh, this is a, an important community space. And the need, as you will know from your own communities, from certainly in my church and English game as well, the need is great. So um, I, good luck with your deliberations. Thank you, Councillor McCabe. So um, if we could move to questions, Councillor Hounsell. All right, questions. Uh, Councillor Hughes. Yes, sorry, I, I'm just trying to understand the, the, uh, the, the concern about the, uh, the, the roof, the skylights, the, the window in the roof, etc. That where the, why is there still a concern when there's now going to be a, an automated uh, blackout system for it? Well, Chair, thank you. Um, obviously, this is an ecology matter, and I'm not a specialist in ecology, but I can only repeat what has been said by the ecologist, and that is that she feels that it's not um, appropriate to rely on um, mechanisms to um, operate uh, for future-proofing and you know, potentially maintenance issues. Sometimes these things fail. And so it's a case of really there is concern that uh, in the longer term, perhaps, a blind in that location may not be working as it should, and that will then have a problem in terms of knock-on effect of light spillage to any bats that are in the tower. At the moment, we can't say whether there are any bats in the tower because there hasn't been a survey, and that's the issue for the ecologists. There's no... She is trying to future-proof against something she doesn't actually know whether there is a need to do or not. Okay, Councillor Jackson. I'm sorry, Chair. I, I had thought that in the officer's report um, there was a photographic survey of the tower which indicated that there weren't any bats there and that there was a, uh, what the ecologist wanted to be assured about was that the apertures would be blocked up so that the bats could not come in subsequently. Um, that, that's my first point, that I, I think actually that objection is covered off. Uh, and secondly, I wondered if the officer was aware that the purpose-built bat house in Ridlington School doesn't have any occupants, uh, but the Victoria Hall was full of bats, and when it was renovated, this is in Radstock, they moved into the public toilets, which had 24-7 lighting. So bats are wild creatures. They don't always go where they are meant to go, is, is my point, uh, regardless of light spillage. But the question linked to that, of course, is, uh, I'm afraid I forgot to notice, and I wonder if you know, uh, whether they have even song at this church, because if they don't, and even if they do, that's only one day out of seven, the lighting in the church um, wouldn't be on that often, I would have thought. Thinking of my own church, it's um, not used that often in the evening. Chair, thank you. Um, well, yes, some of that I can, I can answer positively in the sense that, yes, a, a, a photographic... A high-resolution photographic survey has been carried out by the applicants, which has shown, as far as we can tell, or rather the ecologists can tell, that there are no cracks or holes in the walls near the extension, proposed extension, that may have the opportunity for bats to house in. 
However, there are louvres which are open, partially open, above that in the tower, partially the, the bell chamber and also some little windows below that, which are relatively high up in the tower, but the, the ecologist is still concerned that they could have the potential for housing bats in those areas of the, of the tower. And so there's nothing to do with the fact that the condition of the wall is in good condition. It's the fact that there's a potential opportunity for bats to be using the louvres that are open um, and, and could be going in and out. And therefore, that could be a roost or some form of nesting opportunity for bats or even for birds. So that, that's the area that's still not been fully satisfied in terms of um, information provided to the ecologists for, for them to make a final decision on this. And then your second point about bats being obviously sort of wild creatures that can go anywhere, I absolutely I understand that entirely, but we have not had enough information to be able to shut down that particular area of concern, if you like, with this particular application. Thank you. To answer your question, Councillor Jackson. Well, part way, um, but I, I'm afraid I don't know Wello at all. I didn't spot a stream or a row of trees that could provide a bat line, because bats navigate by these things, so I wasn't sure how many bats would actually find their way here. But still, so that's irrelevant, really, compared with the... Sorry, I'm not a specialist in ecology. I can't answer that. But I do know there is a stream in the village that runs sort of parallel with the high street to the south of the church. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councillor Hodge. Thank you, um, Caroline. I, my, I have a few questions. But my main one is around the, um, the requirements of... Um, Heritage England and um, Society for Protection of Ancient Buildings and that the policy that full and detailed consideration has been given to the alternatives. So that's what I want to really be clear about. I, I, I really understand the um, desire for facilities in the kitchenette and you know, the, uh, all the arguments around that. I would like to, when I visited the site, it seemed to me that the Victorian vestry, um, I'd like to understand why, um, whether that was fully ex explored in terms of um, having potential to be changed as a, a kind of existing structure, add-on structure that is in a much less visible location. Um, it, it seems that it could actually be expanded beyond the boundaries of its, um, looking at the plan, there's uh, expansion possibilities and also with that beyond the boundaries of a the existing church without it being very, very visible in that location. Um, so, and also I wondered whether there were, we've been shown five options that have been considered, but were there other options that um, were taken, were proposed um, by yourself or in pre-app that aren't in this list of five um, that could have been considered? So I think that is really important to be sure that there are absolutely no other alternatives. Um, so, and the other two points I have is that the heights of the um, propo proposal in relation to the window at the, on, the, on, on the, um, that elevation, the three stained glass windows, was it possible to have it lower than the um, window? I know we've got a, a dip down and then a coming up of the height, so we've got a raised skylight. I just wonder why we have a raised skylight, because it, it's in a sight line to the to the um, stained glass windows. So without that, it would be a slightly flatter roof and you, you wouldn't, the, the view to the windows wouldn't be um, um, blocked a little bit. And uh, finally, so there was a minor point about the toilets in the, within. Is it, is it okay to have toilets opening directly onto a kitchenette? I just wondered about that. It, I know, in the, I'm not sure whether law has changed about that. Oh, thank you. That's uh, quite a number of um, questions. Um, so to go to your first point about the options, um, the options that I've outlined in the committee report were very much what we investigated at pre-application stage. 
Um, and that was done in parallel with the diocesan advisory committee who were present when we were looking at the church the first time round, if you like, back in 2018. Um, so, so that was um, the way I've summarized them is roughly what they were looking at at the time. Um, so that was um, uh, the facilities to go into the vestry. Um, there was also an idea of putting um, a link on the north door of the church and creating a sort of an extension out into the uh, churchyard there. Um, they also looked at um, potentially, although I don't know quite how much was looked at, uh, having a, an independent toilet in the churchyard and then kitchen facilities um, placed in the church tower. Um, and they also looked at putting the toilets and the kitchen into the church tower. Um, and there are a lot of reasons why those weren't progressed. Um, but to go back to your point about the vestry, um, I think the main issue there is the fact that it's not only are, are there liturgical problems in actually if you were in a, you know, at a... Um, church event or ceremony, um, having to use the toilets by going up through the chancel to the most important part of the church, if you like, and then get diverting into the vestry is not the best approach. And I completely understand that. Um, there's also physical problems getting into the vestry. Um, and it's quite a narrow door. And I don't know whether it would actually meet current um, disabled um, standards for wheelchair access. So there are a number of reasons why the vestry was discounted. Um, I may, may, may have missed something there as well. I don't have my um, crib sheet in front of me, I'm afraid, but um, that was essentially what the problem was there. Um, I don't know whether that's covered what you yeah. wanted to know about that particular That's area. fine for the options. I mean, the, there are maybe a couple of options that haven't really been looked at, and those are very, very simple. In simple terms, um, I think what Historic England were, were getting to um, suggest in their most recent response, which was received relatively recently, is to put a kitchenette of some very simple kitchenette into the base of the tower which would require services, so there would still be a need to get water and waste into and out of that location, um, and then to have a separate toilet facility within the grounds somewhere, not attached to the church. So that was the sort of solution that they were suggesting. Um, that's an option that I don't think has been fully explored, because I think when... We were discussing it with the church originally at pre-app stage. They were talking about having the, the toilets and the kitchen in the, t the base of the tower, which for operational reasons, if you like, when they have weddings and using the west door, it's not a, a good thing to come past a kitchen and a toilet. It would not give them enough space. And there's also the bell chamber to consider so all those factors would have to be taken into consideration and, and I, I didn't work for that reason. So hopefully that's covered those yes, points. Yes, it seems that you don't feel there are other options really from this. I do think there's another option, which is to just have a kitchen unit or facility in the base of the tower and then have a separate independent toilet within okay. the grounds. But that's not something that I think... Um, the parish okay. council would be ha happy with. Lovely. The other two questions were just on the levels of the roof in relation to the stained glass windows, um, because it has got a, a skylight that comes up a bit. Yeah, um, so whether all that was necessary, yeah, and so finally, that whether you can have toilets that open directly onto a kitchen. Sorry. Kitchenette. So, so that this picture shows the um, window in question that will be mildly affected by the proposal. Um, and uh, in order to get the um, extension in that space, the architects have designed it so that the base of the sill is where the lead will be, or the, sorry, 
metal worked for the roof will be chased into the stonework. So it will have some impact, but um, I think it's mainly going to be the parapet wall, which is on this lower, you can just see here, that the parapet of the extension is built up. So that will start to impede on views only. Whereas when you see it in section, you can see that it's deliberately designed to come below that sill. In terms of your question about having kitchen and toilet facilities, and toilets opening into the kitchen, I, I am afraid I can't answer that. I don't know what the answer is. I don't know what the current standards are in terms of that particular point. Okay. <clears throat> um, Councillor McPhee. Okay, thank you. As a former director of the Institute of Food Research, I'm very uneasy about toilets opening into an area where food is being prepared. Okay, I, I don't suppose... Uh, Chris, can you answer that? All I can say, really, Chair, is that it, it's, not, it's not a matter for this committee. Um, th those are matters dealt with by the building regulations, so irrespective of whether the building regulations um, allow for that or don't allow for that, uh, that's not material to the decision that the committee will be making today. My understanding is that you can have a, 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 a loo off of a kitchen provided there's a door and a hand basin. But as I say, that's, that's not a planning matter. Thanks for that clarification. Um, Councillor Bromley, you had a question? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Carla, for your very, very um, informative um, presentation. Thank you. Um, it's just really, uh, just to come back to Councillor Hughes' question about this sort of roof. I still don't quite understand this thing about the roof light and the blinds and this need for this um, roof light, really. And just the second question was about the use of the aluminium, if you could just clarify that and how that supposedly blends with the, with the roof of the church. I'm not quite sure how that works, really. I'm oh, sorry. Um, so the roof itself will be hidden behind a parapet upstand. So the chances of seeing the roof light itself is very negligible. Uh, the roof itself will be a metal roof, which is turncoat stainless steel, which is quite often used in, in circumstances like this rather than lead. Um, it will have the same appearance as lead, but because it will be hidden behind the parapet, it's very unlikely you'll see it unless you're standing on top of the tower looking down. So in that respect, um, I don't think there's an issue um, as I've said in my report, there's no issue with the materiality of what is being proposed. The windows themselves, as you can see, they're mainly glazed, but they will have aluminium um, frames. But I imagine once we um, uh, go down into the grain of this detail, it would be very um, unlikely you'd notice that they're aluminium because they'd probably be dark frames. Um, obviously, this is something that is subject to conditions if you do dis you know, determine the application against officers' um, recommendations. But it, they can, they can, obviously, that sort of information can be dealt with through condition. Um, uh, in terms of, sorry, you asked something else about... Oh, the blinds. Um, well, as I said, I'm, I'm not a specialist in ecology. I can only tell you what um, the ecologist has said in their um, latest response to what the um, applicants were offering. Um, they, they are concerned about how enforceable um, a blind, an automated blind would be if it's, it suddenly stops working, for instance, which is not something that can happen, 
whether that would then have a, a knock-on harmful impact on any bats that may be living or roosting in the tower. And because we don't have any information about that, she is, if you like, con offering that concern up um, just to, sh to ensure that there is no potential issue in the future. So ideally, what we're saying is that we, under normal circumstances, we would have asked for a bat survey or an engineer who is a specialist in light, lighting to go on site or, or to assess the plans before they were um, put forward to the committee. But um, in this situation where the church has not got a huge amount of money to force them to do that sort of, or ask them to, or insist that they should do that sort of survey now is, is something we've had difficulty in doing. Um, and so that this, this issue wouldn't normally come to you if it was, a, for instance, a householder application because we would have got that information already. So that's why we're saying there's insufficient information in terms of the ecology. Okay. <clears throat> so I have one more person on my list of questions, and then we're going to, have to take a very short comfort break because we've been going for an hour and a half nearly. Councillor Hounsell, you had a question. Uh, I have no uh, question and uh, uh, certainly would approve a comfort break. Thank you. Right. Nobody else got any questions? I'm going to say it's to have all this conversation about toys. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so, sorry, no more questions then. Okay. Ten minutes, please. Zoom, please, and um, if there are no more questions, move to the debate on this one. Councillor Hounsell. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, right. Uh, my thanks to uh, the officer who's uh, clarified all the issues uh, uh, very clearly. And uh, as the planning officer sets out, it's all about the planning balance. Um, really, it's... Uh, uh, accepted that um, the proposal does cause uh, harm, but less than substantial harm, though at the upper end. And we've got to weigh that against the uh, scale of the tangible public benefits. Now, the officer uh, uh, believes that the balance weighs in favour of uh, the, the, the harm and, um, and hence a recommendation to refuse. Um, I th think that the public benefits have been uh, underestimated. Um, just to get a little bit uh, anecdotal, uh, in my ward there's a, a church, All Saints at Corston. It has attached to it a, uh, a, a, a toilet facility uh, extension. Uh, it's very well used uh, and I can see how, how vibrant the, uh, the church has become and a, a sort of focal point in, in the community. Uh, and just one other little anecdote, I used to take my late father in his 90s uh, to two churches in his benefice, one at North Bradley, one at Southwick, one had a port at North Bradley, the other one had an inside toilet, and I could see for myself that the immense benefit of having an inside toilet to, um, to users of, of, of the church. Um, I think that what's being proposed is the sort of least worst option. It's the, it's the best fit. A church is not a museum. It evolves over time. We talk about the Victorian vestry, which almost makes the point that uh, in the Victorian era, they, they added on the vestry at one end, and, uh, and now we've got this proposal now. So um, the church needs to be uh, a, a, an active building, uh, it's not a museum, um, and 
having these facilities will, uh, as we've heard from the people that spoke, will provide uh, considerable community benefits of, uh, of many kinds. So, uh, summing up, uh, I, I agree with the officer in that, that uh, she's made it clear what the consideration is, but I put much greater weight uh, than the officer on the tangible public benefits, and I'm at the moment minded to, uh, 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 to um, recommend that uh, we, we don't support the officer recommendation, but permit this application. Thank, Thank you, you Councillor Hansel. Councillor Hughes. Thank you. I, I, mean, I find myself uh, agreeing with uh, Councillor Housel. Um, I mean, I appreciate that this is a, a Grade 1 listed building. Um, however, I mean, I was brought on, up on the principle that um, churches are community hubs and, say, not museums. Um, and actually, well, actually, both my parents were ministers in the church, so uh, maybe I'm a bit biased there. Um, but also, I think, I mean, in terms of financial viability... Um, the best way to maintain this type of historic building is through higher attendance. And you're only going to achieve those higher attendances if you make it a, pra have a practical solution for things like toilets and kitchen facilities. So I don't have any issue at all with the, with the, with the design um, in terms of how it affects the current fabric of the building. I guess my only concern is this issue of the, is, is, of the skylights, um, it's a shame we don't have a, a bat survey, which would give us more clarity on whether there is actually a bat population we should be concerned about or not. Um, and I don't know how important the skylight is to the, to the church, to their design, whether that's something they would want to consider changing that, part, that aspect of their design and whether that could be done through delegate to permit if it were an option. Um, so... Um, I'm not sure about the officer's concern about the automated system breaking down. I would assume that any automated system for closure of the roof, of the skylight, would also have some sort of manual override. So I would assume there would always be a mechanism to be able to, to shut it off, whether it's manual or automated. So I, I, I do agree with, with Council Housel that uh, I'm in mind to permit, but I would say I still have this concern about the, the, the skylight. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Jackson. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. This is a very difficult one, obviously, uh, and it partly hangs on how you understand church. It's a weakness of the English language that the word for the building, church, derives from the Greek for the Lord's house, but we also use that for the community. And we've got to weigh up the well-being of the community against uh, some damage to the fabric. Um, I think it's really important, as several speakers and Councillor McCabe have stressed, to understand this is a living community worshipping here, uh, not wanting to be disturbed by the sound of a flushing toilet at a, a sacred moment in the Eucharist or anything. And it's got to have the space and the ability to develop in the coming centuries. So let's look at it in, you know, in brass tack, in hard tax, brass tax. There is an issue around financial viability. This has got to work in terms of pounds and pence because that roof is going to need repairing. Um, the heating bills must be astronomical. Um, they've got to have a way of generating income, and weddings and funerals and other ceremonies are one way of doing this, but I'm sure there are also lots of other fun community things that can be enjoyed in the church as well. Um, what would be the gains if we allow this uh, to go through? Well, we get a very good community facility, uh, obviously, it has to be said, church weddings in numbers are falling. But nevertheless, you know, as a wedding venue, it would be excellent. Um, so there's a gain as a community facility. We're hearing that they're going to have a sparrow terrace. My mind boggles slightly, but I've got a healthy colony of sparrows in my back garden, so I can only applaud the desire to increase the number of sparrows. 
uh, we're promised an archaeological dig, which obviously if we refuse this um, application, uh, it won't happen. And that could be um, very interesting. Um, before sort of about, I don't know, 1400. Anyway, uh, originally there were no gravestones. There were no marked graves. So what this dig might turn up could be extremely useful, though I suspect that when the ground was flattened, it may have been a bit brutal. Um, they're going to take out some of the historic fabric of the building. Well, that might be a, cha a chance to get those stones analysed and find out exactly was, what was there. St Nicholas's Church in Radstock and St Mary's Church in Rithlington are both 10th century churches. And given the way that the um, church was expanding among uh, the Anglo-Saxons in that period, I would expect St Julian's to go back to at least the 10th century, possibly because of that sacred well a bit earlier. But anyway, uh, so you get a dig out of it. Um, as somebody who's quite disabled and had to use that toilet in the graveyard, I can only say the sooner it gets replaced, the better. It is horrific. There is a sill. You can hardly turn round, and heaven help you if you're in a wheelchair. And in this day and age, we've got to consider equalities. Uh, Jesus came, said that, you know, a doctor, um, that he came to call the sick, not the well, who had, the well people who had no need of um, a doctor and we you know it's really important for disabled people to be part of the community and to have equal access to toilet facilities uh, you know English heritage one has every admiration for the work they do but have they considered what it would be like trailing across the graveyard um, in the pouring rain or the snow um, if you I thought the pictures and the whole research the officers put into this absolutely admirable. Now, we saw a picture that we didn't, of something we didn't see on the site visit, namely from the top of the field on the north side, looking back to the church, there's a not very beautiful cow shed or something. That blocks your line of sight into the church. If that Obviously, an agricultural building in an agricultural setting is completely appropriate, but it doesn't add to the aesthetics, quite the contrary. And I actually think that the point that was made by Councillor Hansel is a very good one, that you would get symmetry by allowing this extension. You've got Victorian on your left-hand side as you look at it, and then you would have this one on the right-hand side. And churches have grown and developed over the centuries. They were community want to carry it forward. I would, I'm going to propose that we vote delegate to permit, the delegation being in order to get the BAT survey done, because that is clearly the, the negative at the moment. So may I propose, Chair, delegate to permit. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. It's on the grounds that the community, the benefits to the community and the church and its need to establish fi financial viability outweigh the harm to the historic building. Thank you for that clarification. Do I have a second? Uh, Councillor Davis, you were going to speak next anyway. So. Is that yeah, yeah, you were going to do the proposal? Councillor Jackson's finished on. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm more than happy to uh, second that because um, I may just check with delegate permit there's one or two things we might want to add in to make sure there's a bat survey which you've mentioned and the other option is maybe the, whether the roof light's sufficient and details to do with the windows but what I was also going to say is um, I grew up very close to here in Farley Hungerford which you heard spoken about and yes it's a much smaller community but that church is now closed and it has no facilities there um, Okay, it's a much smaller community, but in the um, benefice where I go to church, um, which is in uh, Councillor McCabe's uh, patch as well, one of the churches there has no facilities on site, and you have to go across the road if you want to use toilets and things, and that's not been in all that long in the hall. The other one has a toilet and kitchenette under the tower, but, um, it, and it's at the back of the church, but it's quite true. If you want to go to the loo, you have to think about whether you're going to flush it or not and what part of the sermon you're in. Um, and the church right by me, which I go to equally regularly, um, we have a kitchenette there. And I know when my husband was buried, and we, there was, it was full, and my brother-in-law was in a wheelchair, we came out through the back under the tower because it was level. And actually walking through where the kitchen was wasn't the most um, 
appropriate thing, although we did a lot of catering, and so I did think to myself, my husband would probably have a little smile that we were going that route out, but it probably wasn't the most appropriate thing. But as I say, when I was in church yesterday, Tuesday teas, yes, the kitchenette is handy under the tower, but I think, and I have been on the PCC, I've been a church warden, so I'm quite au fait with the process of getting things through the DAC and having to get a faculty which will be running alongside this. Um, I think this is the best solution, and I fully um, would support um, the, uh, the uh, recommendation to delegate to permit. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Um, we have some more people for the debate, but um, so at the moment we have a motion on the table to overturn the officer's recommendation for the reasons stated, delegate to permit. Um, just, uh, can I just ask Chris, are you clear about what I, I've got that survey here and the materials? Yes, thank you, Chair. I think, um, I think if, it's obviously within the committee's gift to uh, delegate to permit subject to a BAT survey and so on. But I think, I think we need some guidance in terms of w w what officers, officers should do if they are unsuccessful in obtaining that BAT survey, because clearly previously we failed in our attempts to, to, to obtain a BAT survey. So I think, I think we could, it would be useful to have some guidance in terms of would the committee uh, like it to come back to committee if, if, if we're unable to secure a BAT survey or, 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 or another option. Okay, thank you. I mean, I maybe suggest I'm looking at Councillor Jackson, who who proposed the motion. But you know, perhaps well, I if there if there are if there are bats, then then the roof light could possibly well, you know, go, I'm which Councillor Hughes about mentioned. Bats. Um, uh, seriously, though, I think it ought to come back to committee. Perhaps if we can't get bat service survey, and I'm also wondering if we should do what we did at the previous meeting and say we would like it back by the 26th of April, that's feasible. Could, could there be an option that the roof light is not included? Or is that too big a change to make? I, 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 the committee would be able to delegate to permit subject to further negotiations, but I, I don't think it would be reasonable to sort of prescribe the design of, of the proposal at the committee meeting today. So if, if, if the committee is minded to go down that way, it, it would need to be for further discussions to take place between officers and the applicant. Okay, okay so I think what we've arrived at then is that um, it's delegate to permit for the BAT survey if there, is, if, there, if there is any issue with getting the BAT survey done, then this need, that needs to come back to committee because we may not necessarily then do the delegate to permit. Is, is that okay? Is that enough? Yes, thank you, Chair. Just, just one final point. The, the, the survey season for BATS um, doesn't really begin until the end of April, beginning of May. So the, the BATS survey won't be able to be carried out for a few, couple of months anyway. So it's just to bear that in mind in terms of timing. Okay, but I think it's the commitment to do the survey that, that is, is what we need. I mean, actually, that's a very good point because hopefully all BATS are wrapped up and asleep at the moment. Uh, yes, Councillor Hassan. Right, just that, um, uh, speaking personally, uh, I think the public benefit is so strong that uh, the BAT survey, is, it, uh, to my mind, is, is, is minor in comparison. I wouldn't want this decision to hinge on whether there's a BAT survey. I think we've heard enough for it not to come back. It, it just seems to be causing uh, the, the church community unnecessary delay. Uh, and, and angst if we um, uh, do anything that indicates further delay. So <clears throat> if, if you feel that, then I, I guess that... I'm happy, to revise. I'm happy to revise it then to just permit if it's unre going to cause an unreasonable delay. Okay, so uh, I need to go to Councillor Davis to ask whether she would second that with the, just a permit. Yeah, well, yeah. I, I think it would be wiser to keep some con delegate permit just to double check to keep some condition so there's some correspondence going because we've got no conditions clearly here and there may be one or two want to be adding. So I'm not worried about the BAT survey overly, but I would prefer it said delegate to permit just to allow some conversation, not that it would then have to come back to us. But uh, perhaps Chris could give us a bit of clearer guidance. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I, I agree with Councillor Davis. 
um, if, if members are minded to delegate, well, grant permission, I, I would recommend that that's delegate to permit so that we, the case officer can um, resolve um, and, well, produce a draft of um, conditions to impose. I mean, clearly there need to be the standard time limit and plan list condition, but there's, there was also talk of um, archaeology works, and I believe uh, the archaeologist has asked for a written scheme of investigation, so we'll need to uh, secure that by condition. And also there's some wildlife um, enhancement schemes and, and so on. Mm. So I, I think, um, yeah, I would recommend that the committee uh, delegate to permit subject to the, those conditions being finalised, if, if the committee's minded to go that way. So we've got, so we've got delegates to permit, but we're not specifying what, what the officer needs to do. She, she will... Uh, explore those conditions as part of the delegate to permit. That would be my recommendation, Chair. Yeah. Okay, and Councillor Jackson's fine with that, and Councillor Davis also fine with that. Uh, so I still have Councillor Bromley on the list. I see Councillor Hughes has got her hand up again. Can you wait till after Councillor Bromley? Councillor Bromley. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Yes, um, I, I, would, I would like to support um, Councillor Hansel in, in, in his um, recommendation because um, obviously you know, the church is a, is a, is a, it serves a community function. Um, it serves a need for people who are quite cut off and, and lonely and isolated and they can stay on maybe after a church service if there's a kitchenette and coffee can be served, etc. And uh, if... if um, there isn't this facility, we're still left with this sort of port -a -loo contraption in the grounds, which uh, Councillor Jackson described the use of so eloquently. Um, so obviously that's, that's not a suitable uh, facility for modern times. So thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Hughes, you had another point? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, it, I think we're all in agreement that we want to allow this application through in, in, in some shape or form. But I, still, I do think that the protection of bats is still an important issue and I'm just not sure where we are now with this current proposal um, I mean I think if, if, it's, if the delegate to permit includes the, the production of either a bat survey or a change in the scheme to remove the skylight from the scheme uh, that may be an alternative under delegate to permit that the applicant may want to consider to speed up the process but I think you know we, 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 we need to consider the ecological impact um, I'm not, as I said before, I'm not worried about the, I think that most aspects of this design I think are very good, but I think we still have to consider the bats. So uh, if I understand where we are, um, that the automated blind will still be put in, uh, we're not saying that there has to be a bat survey, but delegate to permit will allow the officer to work through with the applicant um, any other conditions that they feel are necessary, but we're not saying that we want it back here unless there is a bat survey. Okay, so uh, there will be. Uh, are we going to have a bat survey or not? No. So, so if you're unhappy with that, obviously, then you won't want to be voting well, for this. So it's, it's, it's creating an unnecessary dilemma, I think. Um, if there's lots of other work that has to go on um, as Chris pointed out before this reaches its final conclusion, then I, I would assume there were time there was time to have a bat survey as well. But okay. I'll yeah, I don't think it's only a matter of time; it's a matter of cost. And I think what Council Councillor uh, said when he made his point is that the public benefit so far outweighs um, any harm done, including the ecological matters. That the feeling is that it should go ahead anyway, which is why we're not specifying that that has to be done. But of course. Councillor Hughes, if you're not happy with that, then you don't have to support this vote. Does anybody want to further, have I, have I said that in a nutshell? Are you all happy with that? Okay, you had your hand up briefly, Councillor Jackson, but you're okay. Because so I, I had understood things a bit differently, that um, we were going to put a condition in about a BAT survey, but we were not going to make that the determinant of the decision, that it Basically, we would like one, but if it can't be managed, it can't be managed. Well, I'm sure the officer will look at that when she looks at... I think the important thing is that we're not saying that the permission is dependent upon that happening. Yeah. Yeah, everybody happy with that? 
Okay, we can move to the vote then. So, the motion on the table is to overturn the officer's recommendation and go for a delegate to permit proposed by Councillor Jackson and seconded by Councillor Davis. All those in favour? That's unanimous. Thank you very much, everybody. Okay. You're all right to go. Oh, Councillor Crossley, I believe, needs to excuse himself from the meeting now. Uh, if everybody else is okay, we'll go straight on with the next item, which is Temple Street, Cainsham. Hopefully the next two items will be fairly swift. I know we normally break for lunch at one, but I'd like to get this all done this morning if possible. Okay, are we all ready to continue? I can ask the officers to do a presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this should be hopefully a relatively straightforward one. So this application uh, relates to the numbers 20 to 30 Temple Street, Canesham. It's for the alteration of existing shop fronts at number 20 and 22. It is also proposed to replace the first floor windows uh, along the row 20 to 30. Uh, the ward is within Canesham. The reason why it has come to committee is because this is a council-led application as part of the uh, Canesham Heritage Action Zone, and it involves more than two properties, which, as followed by the scheme of delegation, it's why it's come to committee. Thank you very much. So, Sorry, is there some problem over here? No? Okay, thank you. So, Can I make a declaration? I sit on the board of the Canesham development in Temple Street. I thought I would be all right not mention it because it's a procedural thing. Okay, thank you. We'll note that. On that one? Good. Thank you. So just to give you some context, so this is a site location plan for those you aren't familiar. So it's on Temple Street, uh, opposite the former fire station and near the uh, Canesham Civic Centre. Uh, the works are relatively uh, straightforward. So for uh, shops number 20 and 22, there are alterations proposed to the shop fronts. The existing shop fronts are part of a later 20th century alteration and as part of the proposal, it is uh, proposed to lower the existing fascia signage board so that it sits in line with the rest of the terrace and to introduce stall risers to uh, the bottom of the shop front. So this will give better proportions to, to the shops. Uh, for the rest of the terrace, it's proposed to change the first floor windows. So at the moment, they're single uh, glazed sash windows and it's proposed to introduce timber uh, double glazed slash windows uh, and that's for the context here in terms of that's existing uh, arrangement so you've got 20 and 22 and then that's the rest of the terrace so those are the first floor windows that will be replaced and finally the officer recommendation is to bit for the reasons stated in the committee report Canesham Town Council is in favour of this application and since the public consultation period has ended there has been no uh, comments provided as part of this application thank you very much we have no speakers on this one do we have any questions from anyone no okay we can move to the debate anybody want to uh, speak on this Oh, sorry, yes, you're quite right. It should be Councillor Simmons, first of all. Thank you, Councillor McPhee. Um, the Heritage Action Zone uh, was created about three years ago, and Temple Street, this alteration is an ongoing process. It's um, necessary to upgrade Canesham High Street and Temple Street, and I have, I'm sure that this will be an improvement on what we've got now and I think we need to agree that it goes through because it's government money involved as well as Bain's money and it just should go through I have 
I've got nothing else to say, really. Everything is being, is being programmed, and it's happening as we speak, um, and there's no reason for anybody to object to it. Okay, thanks to Councillor Simmons. Anybody else want to contribute to the debate? Councillor Jackson? I think it's a, I, I'm in favour of this, but I, I wondered if we had any control over signage, because one of those signs was rather in your face, to put it crudely, uh, of one of the shops, and whether there was going to be any sort of colour code or anything. Uh, which, of course, reminds me of a little matter of an important building the other end of the street being the wrong shade of blue. But that was a listed building. Is this, are these, by any chance, heritage assets? Or? If I could pass to the officer. Thank you for your question. Um, so the buildings in question are not listed. So in terms of the overall paint scheme, we, it wouldn't be under our control as part of the planning system. Uh, in terms of the existing signs which you saw in those photos, they're actually proposed to be amended. So the, the overall scale of the fascia, timber fascia, will be reduced in scale. Um, so it will look far more kind of appropriate to the streetscape than what is there existing. Thank you very much. Uh, anybody else want to contribute to the, bit, to the debate? If not, perhaps somebody would like to propose a motion. Councillor Hansel. Uh, yes, I'd like to propose a motion. Uh, thank you to the officer. Uh, thank you to uh, Councillor Simmons uh, and uh, the answer to the question from Councillor Jackson. Uh, from all I've heard, uh, I'm perfectly satisfied um, with this uh, recommendation by the officer to permit, uh, so I'll put that forward as a motion. Thank you, Councillor Hanks. So do I have a second, uh, Councillor Jackson? Thank you. Any more contributions to the debate from anyone? No, I'll go to the vote then. Uh, the motion we have on the table is to support the officer's recommendation proposed by Councillor Hounsell and seconded by Councillor Jackson. All those in favour? Nothing unanimous. We're on a roll. Uh, sorry, thank you very much. Thanks, the officer. So on to the last item for consideration, which is New Leaf Barn. If we could just switch officers again. If you'd like to start your presentation when you're ready, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is an application for the change of use of an agriculture barn into a single dwelling with associated facilities for the holiday lets that exist on the site. Um, the site is within um, the farm unit of Newleaf Farm, which is in Bathampton um, Ward, or Bathaven, sorry, in the Bathampton uh, village. The reason why this application has come into committee today is because the applicant is a um, relation or direct uh, family contact of, the, um, of a sit-in Baines councillor. <clears throat> so it shows two um, maps on the screen here. So the one on the left shows New Leaf Farm in relation to the surrounding vicinity. And then the um, plan on the, on the right shows the barn that is subject to the application, which is this one here, and the associated sort of other um, buildings that are within the, that are within the uh, site context. Uh, this is the existing elevations of the barn that's um, subject to the application. As you can see, the main barn is sort of this area here, and there's a significant extension that's gone on for the whole rear elevation of the, um, of the barn that's proposed to be removed as part of this application. So this is the proposed site plan um, that was... Um, submitted. You can see here this is the um, barn that's subject to the application. There's also an element of built form that extends out into the hard standing area here. Um, and in sort of green, and this is the area here of the large um, rear part, portion of the barn that's going to be removed as part of the application as well. So this is the um, ground floor plan and the elevations of the proposed barn conversion. As you can see here, this is the um, this is the dwelling here, and then you've also got the recreational space for the um, facilities for the holiday lets as well. This is the element of built form that extends over the site as well. This is the same elevations, but with the um, first floor plan for the, for the dwelling as well. 
And it's also got uh, the entrance to the dwelling is there in the, in the middle where there's a section that's going to be cut out of the barn as well. Um, these are just some photos of the um, barn in its current state. Um, apologies, they're not, not particularly great, but it's sort of there's other stuff there as well. The barn at the moment is sort of um, breeze blocks up until, well, concrete blocks up until about halfway, then the rest of it is all timber clad. And then these are some views. So where this van is parked here is essentially where the, um, the new built form will extend out from the building and it's sort of come to where, where this forward is parked here as well. Um, this is the section of the barn that's proposed to be moved as part of the application. It does extend the whole length of the barn, so it's a considerable sort of amount of volume that's going to be removed as part of the application as well. And then this is just a view of the site context of the, um, of the site as well. You can see the, the barn that's proposed to be converted there. And then this is the um, main access track that came off, off the um, main road. There was some negotiations with the applicant regarding um, highways considerations. So initially, um, highways did have an objection to the scheme, um, sort of on, on the basis of it being an unsustainable location, because uh, it was only accessible if you go back to the, to the maps. Its main access is along this 500 metre long private driveway. However, the applicant has submitted further information regarding sort of the interconnectivity of the site regarding footpaths and cycle paths to the local facilities and bus, bus routes as well. Um, and highways will be consulted on this and they remove their objection to the scheme. I'll just go back to the photos. And the officer recommendation is to permit subject to the conditions set out in my committee report. Thank you very much. We have one speaker on this. It's ben Smith, if you could come up to the front when you're ready. Up to the front here, yeah. you like to switch the microphone on and start when you're ready. Okay, ready? Good afternoon. My name's Ben Smith, and I'm a director of local firm Batterham Smith Architects. I'm representing Steve Haller, who's the applicant, and his partner, Kevin Guy, today. As I'm sure you're aware and has been explained already, the application is in front of you due to Kevin's role on the council, and not because of any objections. Uh, and I'm delighted to say that, as you've heard already, that we've got uh, approval or recommended approval from the planning officer, and we've been working hard with him and with consultees to satisfy all the questions that have been raised during the um, application. There are also no op objections from Southampton Parish Council, and then no other local le letters of objection. So to give you a little background, Newley Farm has been in the Haller family for over 20 years, with Steve and his father managing a small beef cattle herd on the site. The herd is no longer with us, and the farm is now uh, supports a successful holiday let business, as you've heard. This application is for the conversion of the steel frame barn that you've seen, to a dwelling and it incorporates much needed facilities to help the letting business run more smoothly and successfully including communal areas for the guests to enjoy and amenity and operational areas such as laundry and stores for the staff. The dwelling will enable Steve himself to live on site because uh, he's the site manager so that will help the operation of the letting business. From a design perspective, we've retained the agricultural aesthetic of the barn, but have relocated the unattractive lean-to that you've seen from the south side to the north side of the barn, thus consolidating the building on the site, which is beneficial in its greenbelt setting. This has allowed us to create a new pedestrian courtyard or farm courtyard in the center of the group of buildings, which we think will greatly benefit the scheme and the guests. In addition, we're also creating a pathway through the barn, which we think is a fun way to link up the two uh, disconnected areas of the site, so north and south at the moment. And it's worth noting that this application is submitted on the back of two previous prior approvals that were granted for the conversion of the barn into three dwellings. Uh, so we are now proposing to create only one dwelling. This reduction is clearly less harmful to the green belts and therefore hope that you can vote in favour of the application today. 
So in summary, firstly, the application has been approved by the case officer, has no ob objections against it, and is only in front of you today because of Kevin's role on the council and is linked to the applicant. Secondly, the design is low-lying, uses the existing farm buildings and consolidates the buildings on the site, creates a new farm courtyard, which is appropriate to its setting, and previous approvals for the three dwellings on the site have now been reduced to a single one. If you could bring your <coughs> comments to a close, please. Yeah, just a final point is that this is, proposal is designed to improve the running of a successful local business through the creation of exciting indoor and outdoor spaces for guests, improved facilities for staff, and beneficial ability Thank you. That's to stay on site. You're out of time, I'm afraid. Okay. That's Thank all. you. Thank you for your time. Right, does anybody have any questions? Councillor Jackson. Well, it's rather an academic point, but just as a matter of interest, uh, this is Greenbelt area, we've been told. Um, so I was wondering if this extension is adding to the volume by more than a third of the existing building. Uh, I'm assuming, of course, the building was there before 1947. Thank you, Councillor. Um, essentially, um, as from aerial photography, the fame of the barn was is um, original in terms of when it was built, but the um, lean-to extension at the rear has been an addition, I believe, that was sort of in after 2013 being the uh, rough date. Um, however, because of its length and because of how tall it is, if you go back to the original um, photograph, the original plans here, you can see it spans the whole length of the barn, and it is quite, I think from my from memory, that's about 28 metres, so it is quite a, a long distance. Um, so it does involve quite a large amount of volume. Um, so the addition of the um, built form to the front of the barn is within the third sort of um, volume increase, if you count that section here as, as non-original. There's no measurable volume increase in the proposal. Okay, thanks. Any more questions? No? We move to the debate. Anybody like to open the debate or propose a motion? Councillor Davis. I will, if no one else is. Um, I'm quite happy to go with the office's recommendation as printed in our papers. Thank you very much. Do I have a seconder for that? Councillor Jackson? I mean, I don't think it's really infringing on the openness of the green belt or any of the other green belt restrictions, so I'm happy to second. Thank you very much. So the motion we have on the table is to support the officer's recommendation to permit, proposed by Councillor Davis, seconded by Councillor Jackson. All those in favour? No, another unanimous. So everyone this morning, well done. Okay, so that's thank you to the officer. That um, takes us through our um, items for consideration this morning. Um, we had a public right-of-way that has been uh, withdrawn, so we don't need to do that one now. Um, appeals report, item 10. Do members have any questions or comments on the appeals report? No? Oh, you're asked to note it. The date of the next meeting will be on Wednesday, the 5th of April. Uh, we have two meetings in, when, in April, if I can remind people. Um, and there aren't any site visits at the moment, but if any are scheduled, they will be on Monday the 27th of March. Councillor Jackson, did you have a point? Well, I just, the officer did promise me an update report on this question of the shades of blue on the Canesham listed building, which we voted should change. And there was also a question of the fenestration of this building. And um, I was wondering if further enforcement action was going to be taken to get this building to conform to the decision of the committee. Chris, you were able to answer that one. I'm, I, I'm able to bring a, an update back to the next committee, Chair, with a detailed written update. Thanks, that's noted. Anything else from everybody? No. Close the meeting then. Thank you very much.